sale of books to some extent. I guess that's what it was intended to do. And it, uh, but nonetheless, it's going well. So, so it's you know all good. Very good. And what's the uh, what's the reaction? Uh, it's not just me asking this question. It's uh, one of your one of your partisan colleagues, uh, uh, John Stewart. If you're watching, John was asking what uh, what you made of the reaction from within the Liberal Party to uh, to kick you out to ban you. Um, well, there, there are people in the Liberal Party that that were uh, arguing I should be expelled from the Liberal Party yeah. when I was Prime Minister. So, uh, <laughs> so this is nothing new, but it's it has uh, nothing has been heard of it since it was it got a good run in the Murdoch press, as as uh, you know uh, attacks on me always do. And um, but uh, no, nothing's happened about that. I, don't I was going to say the Labor Party let uh, Mark Latham hang about for a number <clears> of years, even after his his diaries were published. You know, that's uh, no one. No one was threatening to kick him out then. Well, it would be. It wouldn't say much for one's commitment to free speech if you expelled someone from a political party Very because true. of a book. Very true. And Joe, Joe Hildebrand's noted on Twitter that um, it's too late for me to try to recruit you to the Labor Party in any event. So. You know, it's a it's a moot point. It's a moot point. Uh, look, in, in reading in reading the book, um, I was really struck with it. And I've, I've spoken uh, to a few friends. Um, in the first in the first thirty pages, or thirty one pages to be specific, you'd met with, and I'm going to go through a little bit of a list here. You met with Jack Lang, Bill McKell, which is obviously the namesake yeah. of this institute. Yeah. Uh, John Ducker, Bob Carr, Bob Ellis, Governor George Wallace, which uh, all the U.S. political buffs. Uh, we'll get a kick out of. Yes. Um, are, are you still a lieutenant colonel in the uh, Alabama? Uh, I, I think so. Or? Yeah. Well, I am. Yeah. They haven't. I haven't been cashiered, as far as I'm aware. Uh, <laughs> Very good. Uh, you'd met with Neville Rand, uh, yeah. John Singleton, Kerry Packer, and Rupert Murdoch. Um, I mean, this—it's a fantastic litany of characters by such a young age. Mm -hmm. um, I guess my question is, how much of that is you, just being obviously a intelligent bloke with a with a you know fair degree of, of front about you but how much of that was the was the sydney or the australian business community at the time well most of those people weren't in business of course um, <clears throat> um yeah i look i um you know i was just i was just a very uh enthusiastic energetic young guy and i always had lots of jobs uh, and I was a, you know, as a journalist, and so as a young person, if you're a journalist, you gives you a sort of license to go and talk to anyone, or a rationale to go and talk to anyone. So I met a lot of those people. I mean, Neville, of course, uh, I I sort of got became reacquainted with in politics because uh, he was actually an old friend of my mum's, so uh, he had known me, uh, you know, he'd known me from the earliest age. In fact, he used he used to say he had known me from when I was en ventre sa mère, which uh, uh, is the bit of old legal French, which is uh, describes when a person is, uh, you know, is still is, is unborn, conceived but unborn. Right. <laughs> Very good. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I guess I'm. I guess what I'm what I'm wondering is, considering the flattening of social mobility over the last decade or so. Mm. Um, is it still possible for a Malcolm Turnbull to occur? Is it still possible for a kid to come from relatively modest backgrounds uh, uh, and and reach the the heights that you have in business and law and um, and politics? Is that still possible, or are we are we more stratified now than we were? You know. Well, I hope not. Years ago? I hope not, Sam. I mean, I'd like to think that we were more. You know, I, I think Australia is a <clears throat> Australia is not an equal society, but we are egalitarian in our attitudes. Um, the, it may be that the eastern suburbs when I was growing up was more egalitarian. I mean, it was, um, you know, Sydney was a much smaller city. And, you know, the, um, you know, while I, look, I went to a, you know, a great school, I mean, there are lots of great schools, uh, many of which are, you know, are, um, are state schools. I'm not, but I just, the school I went to, Sydney Grammar School, is a private school. Um, and, you know, while my dad, you know, struggled with that, um, 
from time to time. Um, he, you know, I went there because I was a boarder because my parents had split up, etc. Um, I look, I, I, I had a very good start. You know, I mean, I wasn't, you know, my background wasn't, you know, that of the plutocracy or you know uh, great wealth. But I had a very, very good start. You know, I had a, um, you know, I mm. went to a, a good school. I had parents that encouraged me. Yes, my, you know, my mother left when I was young, but but we stayed in touch. And my father was just an absolute rock. And but I was always very energetic. You know, and I, I look literally from the time I, um, you know, I was I had always had jobs when you know part time jobs when I was at school. Um, I, and I, you know, I worked all my way through university, um, often multiple jobs. I mean, when I, you mentioned Singleton, when I was working for Singleton, I was, you know, I was writing really daggy retail ads for Singleton. And then I was also, um, you know, covering state parliament for Nation Review, 2SM and Channel 9, which was about as, as, um, uh, you know, I, I used to, this is unfair to Nation Review because it wasn't a communist paper but was definitely on the left I used to say I was representing was it was it Marx God and Mammon because 2SM in those days belonged to the Catholic Church right right the SM standing for St Mary's mm. so, so continuing on that idea of um of inequality and I have to say this comes from Alex Wodak who's my mum's old boss so he has yeah, to get a uh, sure. he has to get a shout out of course right. um uh COVID is going to exacerbate and um, amplify all the um, all the unequal structures and, and, and fractures in our society. Uh, it's going to impact a generation of, of generally younger, uh, but entrepreneurs. Um, what should we be doing uh, in the rebuilding coming out of this to ensure, firstly, that this isn't a hugely unequal um uh, catalyst or a catalyst mm. for inequality, uh, but also for entrepreneurs. I mean, you know, if you've just taken out a, a business loan to go and set up a, you know, a coffee cart or a, you know, a microbrewery or whatever else, only to have mm. a global pandemic hit, I imagine mm. your confidence is going to be pretty dampened. Your desire mm. to, to get back into that world is going to be pretty down. What what yeah. can we do about that? Well, well, I mean, Sam, I think the the, the first thing is we need to have a, we need to make sure we have a very robust social welfare safety net. Um, and so I'm very pleased that, you know, JobKeeper was, was instituted. Um, I know there've been some criticisms uh, about aspects of it, but, you know, and that, that's kind of inevitable with a, pol you know, a new policy that's by force of circumstance developed on the run, but so more will need to be done with that. But so the, the social welfare safety net is going to be critically important. That's point one. Point two is there are uh, going to be industries and sectors that are going to be permanently disrupted here. Um, uh, well, permanently or, or at least for a long time. You talked about hospitality, coffee, you know, coffee shops and so forth. That's going to take quite a while to get back to normal. So... Those, there's, there's, we're going to have to, I think, assess the difference between sectors where there was change that was already trending, where the trend has been accelerated. You know, say the trend towards e-commerce, you know, away from bricks and mortar retail, for example. That's one that's obviously was happening, it's being accelerated. And then also sectors which, where this has been, you know, a reversal or a diversion of an existing trend. I mean, there was no, you know, if anything, um, cities were becoming denser. Density was, was as, as I've said, and Luce has always said, density is the solution, not the problem. You know, how are, we go, how, is, how are we going to cope with that? How long is that going to be disrupted, sideswiped? So these are, you know, there are a lot of complexities there. In terms of what government should do, Look, I think this is the time where government has got to step up and invest. Um, the, you know, I'm strongly in favour of a, you know, as an Australian equivalent of a Green New Deal, 
I think this is a time to bring forward infrastructure uh, investment, which um, may have been, you know, you may have projects, uh, whether they're in the energy space or other areas, which were, you know, perhaps not required for another decade. I mean, cross city rail in, in Brisbane is a good example of this. And I just, you know, mentioned this as an example. The, when I was Prime Minister, Infrastructure Australia was of the view that it was a good project, but its time was not yet upon us. And there were other things that would, you know, that had, that were uh, more immediately um, uh, needed. Um, uh, projects like that, that uh, you're going to need to build at some point, this is the time to bring them, bring those and other projects uh, forward. You know, you, you've got to, you don't want to be doing, with all due respects to, you know, the audience here, you don't want to be doing what Rudd did uh, with his second stimulus and having a lot of investment that is, you know, of, of lower quality. Don't compromise on quality, but get, you know, bring things forward uh, is what I, what I believe we should be doing. And, you know, we've got a phenomenal opportunity in the energy space. I mean, we could be, you know, we could have really zero emission energy, electricity certainly, and much cheaper electricity. Uh, and so, you know, bring forward the retirement of some of these uh, coal-fired power stations that are going to be retired and, you know, build the transmission, build the pumped hydro, build the, uh, all of the supporting infrastructure to enable, you know, that combination of renewables plus storage that it, we know now is the cheapest form of new generation. And, uh, you know, this is where government can uh, accelerate that transition. And I, and I think it's, you know, the, the biggest criticism you could make is, oh, we didn't really need to do this for another five or 10 years. Well, that's true, but except we do need to do it because we need to have the, to boost uh, aggregate demand to get the economy going again. I imagine the audience is going to be nodding in, in furious agreement, but I, I, I guess a degree of pessimism here, without you either running the government or in the parliament, I mean, what's the chance that the Liberal Party, the modern Liberal Party has of doing something as bold as that? You know, the, uh, the ability to overcome the terrorists, as you call them in your book, that just hold out intransigent <clears throat> views and refuse to negotiate and refuse to come to the centre of, of politics. How can, you know, doesn't have to be Scott Morrison, but any future Liberal Prime Minister overcome that, that nub of, of the political fringe? Well, it's not easy. It's not easy because they are the, the right of the Liberal Party is prepared to blow the joint up. And mm. you know, that's in the sense that they do operate like terrorists. I hasten to uh, note, not with guns and bombs, I'm not suggesting physical violence, but the, it is a, uh, and I mean, this, you know, this is, everyone knows this is followed events. You've seen this on several occasions. And it is a, it is a very, it's a, it's a really dangerous uh, element in the coalition <clears throat> nowadays, but you know, honestly, uh, I know there are people in the LNP uh, who want the government to build coal-fired power stations and so forth. I mean, it's not so long ago you had um, Abbott and others, you know, wanting to have Hazelwood 2.0, wanted the government to build a new brown coal-fired power station. I mean, can you imagine? I mean, it's like it, it's almost you, you. It's hard to believe that something like that could be said other than as a parody you know it's sort of like it would be in, appear in first dog on the moon you know in the in uh, this satire but it's um they were for real uh, but i don't think there is any i don't i i would be astonished if uh if scott morrison uh way you know waded into that i mean scott was a very strong supporter of snowy 2.0 uh, he's been a strong supporter of the Tasmanian equivalent of that, the Battery of the Nation. Which, you know, they're the two big, big, the two big hydro projects I got underway. Um, and, the, and, you know, Snowy in particular is absolutely critical. I mean, if you look at any of the uh, AEMO's work, um, the, you, 
you know, if, if you took Snowy Hydro 2.0 out of the mix, you have got a huge problem uh, in the NEM in this decade. I mean, everything is assuming that that big, big pumped hydro battery is going to be coming uh, online, you know, around 2025. So it was, uh, it was certainly, uh, it was a, an idea, <clears throat> a project whose time had come, you know, possibly, well, with the benefit of hindsight, they sh should have been built years ago, but you can say that, <laughs> say that about most things. Mm. A, a renewable, uh, Al Gore said that um, renewables are the biggest thing to happen in business since business. Um, uh, uh, do you think renewables are where you're going to get the next wave, the next generation of entrepreneurs coming down the track? Well, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, it's, you're now talking about big dollars, Sam. I mean, it is, I mean I'm a venture capitalist. Uh, and so I'm, you know, I've, and I've done that with Lucy, you know, much of my life. But nowadays, um, solar and wind projects are really the stuff for institutional capital. Mm. You know, it is, it's, it's big infrastructure. I mean, what's, what's happened with <clears throat> renewables um, and by which you're really talking about photovoltaics and, and wind is that the cost per watt has dramatically come down. In the last decade, it's uh, for PV, it's come down by 90% and it's got further to go. So, you know, we are, we're going to see much, much cheaper uh, electricity the challenge is how do you store it? There are really, or well, firm it. I mean, you can firm it with gas, of course, but if you don't want to do that, um, the alternatives are really pumped hydro is, uh, you know, a, a long-standing and very well understood uh, technology, but it's very site-specific. You know, the, the cost. People say, "What is the cost of pumped hydro?" It's like saying, "What is the cost of a bridge?" <laughs> you mm. know, it depends mm. where it is. Mm how long it is, how high it is, and so forth. So um, in the right circumstances, pumped hydro can be very, very, very cost effective as Snowy 2 will be, uh, but those circumstances aren't available everywhere. So then you've got batteries, which are, you know, great, they're, they're modular, they're, you know, it's like a cookie cutter solution, you know what they're gonna cost, but they cost a lot uh, per uh, watt hour stored or kilowatt hour stored. Uh, and then, then the you know the next big one is hydrogen. And uh, if you uh, work, if you assume that you're going to have an excess during many parts of the day of zero marginal cost generation, which we already have, but you're going to have a lot more of it, um, then you know that uh, as you as the electrolysis process becomes industrialized. Um, you will start to see green hydrogen becoming very cost effective. And I think that's the, you know, that will be the, the next big opportunity. And, you know, that's got implications right through the economy, not simply as a way of storing electricity, but also, for example, of making steel without uh, CO2. Because, you know, mm. you can use the hydrogen uh, in the same way that you're currently using um, uh, coking coal to, uh, to make steel. I, I just following up on the the steel question and turning it slightly <clears throat> uh, to a more global uh, question, uh, specifically about China. Yeah, uh, you would have seen today um, uh, in the uh, in the newspaper the AWU, who's Misha Zelinsky has um, has written uh, to a number of forums asking questions in this in this vein. Um, He's asking about. Um, I mean, obviously, you stood up to China when you were when you were prime minister. You you banned Huawei, you banned ZTE from the five G network. You um, uh, you implemented the uh, foreign interference legislation, or you mm. introduced the foreign interference legislation. Mm. Um, now the CCP is threatening to cut off mm. uh, Australian agricultural exports to China mm. um, for as as we can see it. You know, two things, which is. Uh, I think quite a legitimate uh, concern or, or or inquiry from the government into the origins of COVID nineteen, um, but also using as an evidence base the uh, the use of duties that the Australian government has imposed on uh, dumped Chinese steel into Australia. Um, so my my question is, 
what would you do if you were prime minister today and you see over the last couple of days how China is threatening uh, what is the Australian, the sovereign Australian government's um, desire to, uh, to look out for its citizens? Well, <clears throat> the first thing you've got to do is you can't, you, you, once you draw a line in the sand, you can't then back off. You know, you've got to, the government has to stand its ground. That's the first thing. You can't, there's, you don't get anywhere from backing down to bullies, right? And uh, the Chinese ambassador, uh, Cheng, who he made exactly the same threats of trade sanctions against my government in 2018 when we were <clears throat> getting the uh, foreign interference and foreign influence legislation through the parliament. And uh, they, you know, they took exception to that and, uh, you know, brought on the usual range of pressures and the usual range of people in Australia <clears throat> proceeded to um, effectively side with China. Um, you know, the, uh, the business community generally, if there's a dispute, as I say in the book, if there's a dispute, mm. China and Australia can generally be relied on to, uh, uh, you know, side with the China um, because they see the relationship purely through an economic prism. I think the dealing with, look, I'm not going to critique uh, what the Morrison, what Morrison has done or what his government has done, um, other than to say, uh, when you're dealing with imperial powers, and you know, there are really two in the world today, China and the United States, uh, you've got to stand your ground, uh, make your case, uh, obviously avoid unnecessary friction, but don't, comp you know, don't, don't, whatever you do, don't back down. You've got to, you've got to be strong, uh, but also make sure that you conduct your uh, self in a way that is uh, courteous, even if you are provoked with pretty intemperate, uh, you know, um, commentary. I mean, there's no point getting into a slanging match. Um, in other words, take the high road, but just take a very, just play a very, very straight bat. And I think the, uh, you know, at the end of the day, we've got to have a little bit more confidence in ourselves. There is a there is a tendency uh, for a lot of people, particularly in the business community, to act as though China is operating some kind of charity and that they're trading with us because they want to be kind to us. China trades with us because our goods, our services are, you know, attractive in terms of quality and price. Uh, and, you know, we, we respect China's sovereignty and its dignity and China should respect ours. And that's, that's, that's the, you know, that, that is honestly, it's as simple as that. And you just, you can't get into a, uh, a situation where you take a position and then you're sort of running back from it. You know, that's, that's hopeless. If the, uh, if the government follows this advice, and I, I sincerely <clears throat> hope they do, I don't think they should back down at all. Uh, um, <clears throat> and the Chinese government follows through on its threats and there is, you know, an agricultural export boycott or consumer boycott or however they phrased it. Um, well, let me ask that question. Do you think they would follow through on their threat? No, I don't think so. I think they might. Look, they, they, they're they probing and pressuring. And every time, uh, you know, what, what works for them, of course, is seeing examples of uh, the Australian business community turning on their own government. You mm. know, this is the... I mean, when I was, look, the, the position, the issue that I had uh, really related to initially the foreign interference legislation. Now that was not, it was not, you know, directed at China per se or solely, but clearly that was part of the context. You know, we had had the whole scandal involving Sam Dastiari and, you know, it was, you would have had, you know, you couldn't possibly have missed the fact that uh, interference, you know, interference by China and our affairs was an issue. But, it, but it's not, you know, they're not the only country that tries to interfere with uh, the, you know, politics and public affairs of other countries. I mean, you know, the Russians obviously are very active, particularly in the United States and Europe. Anyway, um, we, at the time this debate was going on, 
You had the vice chancellor of Sydney University, no, no less, attacking me uh, and accusing me of sinophobic blatherings. And, you know, just, I mean, staggering stuff. So you can imagine how well received that was in Beijing. So, you know, I, I think the business community uh, uh, and indeed academia ought to sort of think a little bit about if they feel the Australian government's diplomacy is a little less elegant than it than it would be, than they would like it to be, perhaps convey that advice privately rather than, you know, jumping into the media to sort of effectively be a cheerleader for the Global Times. Is this a... Um... A few people have asked this on the on the chat here. Is this an opportunity necessarily for um, for Australian manufacturing coming out of this both <clears throat> COVID and potential Chinese boycotts? Is this a, an opportunity for us to well, get back on our feet with manufacturing? Well, it depends what you mean. It, you know, ma manufacturing. I mean, can cover you know covers a you know wide range of manufacturers naturally. Um, there are some areas of manufacturing where we are unlikely to be uh, competitive uh, because of scale, uh, in some cases because of labour costs. But, you know, with increased automation, the labour cost factor becomes less relevant. So that is, you know, that's making, that will start to bring manufacturing back to uh, developed countries, particularly the larger ones, like the United States. Um, also, people's concern to shorten supply chains and de you know, decomplicate or simplify supply chains is going to support that. Uh, I'm very committed to Australia's future in advanced manufacturing, and the more advanced, the better. I think that's where our biggest opportunities are. One of the reasons I was so concerned that uh, all of our new naval vessels be built in Australia was not simply for, you know, the purpose of ensuring these capabilities were supplied by Australian workers uh, and, you know, and, and, uh, and engineers and so forth. Uh, but because I know that if you have a sovereign defence industry, which we, we, assuming governments stick with the vision, we will have, uh, then what that will do, that will spin off a whole lot of other businesses. You're already seeing that, um, you know, say in the space sector, for example, and there's many other areas, but, you know, you're seeing more innovation in um, critical technologies, defence-related technologies in Australia than ever, and that is because of the, the weight of that big, uh, you know, defence investment that we uh, committed to. So, you know, this is, it was often seen as being, you know, e easy to dismiss as, oh, pork barrelling, oh, you just want to, you know, have, you know, more jobs in Adelaide to, you know, prop up Christopher Pine's electorate or something like that. You know, these are, these are really cheap shots because this investment will go on for generations. You know, it'll be, this will be, this is, these are, this is like a national enterprise. You've got to start somewhere and build a culture of uh, innovation, of design, of engineering, and that, of course, leads to manufacturing. But it's uh, but it is going to be a it's a it's got to be a long term commitment. It's a, it it really is a national enterprise, uh, you know, a national enterprise for an enterprising nation is what we've really got to be committed to. Mm. Can I ask you about uh, about plebiscites? Um, yes. We had um, <clears throat> we had we had quite a few. Um, questions about the marriage equality plebiscite and I, you know I, I don't want to disappoint everyone I think we're just all going to have to agree to disagree about the the mechanism that you chose to go down and for those that are interested by all means read the book buy the book and read the book and and you can see your your thinking through that process hmm. I mean it's fair to say that it wasn't your preferred outcome for resolving uh resolving the marriage equality debate is that fair to say no, I, I, I thought it should be a uh, conscience vote in the parliament. Yeah. Uh, that was my preferred process. But I was landed with the commitment to a public vote, you know, to a plebiscite. Uh, and once made, that's something that is very, I mean, it's very hard 
very hard slash impossible to walk away from. You know, if you say to the people, we're going to give you a say, and then you say, whoops, we've changed our mind, we're not going to give you a say because we think that some of you will say horrible things and we don't trust you to have a civil debate. Um, you know, that's really, if you think about it, that's politically uh, somewhere between very difficult and impossible. So the mm. I think as it worked out, um, the postal vote was actually a great success. And I recognise there was some a lot of heartache and some of the debate was uh, unseemly and offensive and upsetting and cruel. Uh, but you know what? I mean, we had a lot of meat, you know, a lot of unpleasant things were said, uh, you know, about, um, uh, about, you know, marriage equality, you know, was it last year, you know, around the Israel Falau social media post, you know, this, these issues do come up from time to time. But the great thing about the plebiscite, Sam, was, well, firstly, was carried and, you know, that was terrific and we delivered marriage equality. And, uh, you know, with all due respects to Bill Shorten, you know, he, he was on a unity ticket with Tony Abbott. He did not want marriage equality, marriage equality to be delivered by my government. And, uh, and he had his own political motives for that. But the, but the great thing was that 80% of people participated you know, I was so proud of that. I mean, the proud of Australia in a completely voluntary vote that was so easy just to take that envelope and drop it in the bin. And 80% of people chose to vote and 62 plus percent voted yes. So that was a massive national hug for uh, LGBTI people. And, 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 and it was a decision, a democratic decision of the Australian people that is impossible to qualify or backtrack on. You can't say, oh, the politicians weren't listening to the silent majority. That was the people have spoken, you know, and uh, it was... Uh, and, and, and yet, I, and yet I, a number I, I, of I your colleagues... Well. What? And yet a number of your colleagues decided that they weren't going to uh, vote for their yeah. the way their constituents voted and either abstained or, yeah. or crossed the floor and I know they did, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I know, of course they did. Well, I mean, they're entitled um, to do that, but you know, the uh, it was. Um, I think if you go to the people and say, uh, you know, we the parliamentarians are not prepared to make this decision ourselves. We're going to ask you to make it for us, and then when they make it, not voting and <laughs> consistent with what they've said. Uh, you know, you can obviously see the, you know, the inconsistency there. Sure. Anyway, considering the, the good, the good thing was we got it done, right? I mean, yeah. politics is not easy, uh, and you know, most of the commentators, uh, even the people in the press gallery, and certainly the, most of the commentators in social media, uh, do not understand the difficulty and the complexities. You're dealing with people, and people are you know, have, can often be, you know, unreasonable. They can have different agendas. They can have hostile agendas. There's a whole lot of complexity in pulling people together in politics, particularly uh, in the coalition on an, an issue like this, you know, which is really a hot button issue for so many people on the, on the you know, right of politics. So, you know, getting it done was not, was not easy and yet we did and you know there it is and so it's uh and you know traditional marriage has survived you know the uh, um <laughs> all of those terrible consequences which were predicted haven't come to pass was, so uh, con con considering considering its success yeah. um and i i understand this was the first one ever that we passed we had one in 1916 and 17 for conscription i believe I don't um, think I, I, I don't think they were postal ballots though, Sam. I, no, I, no, I, they I, weren't postal ballots. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But I mean, is this going to be a model that future governments will rely on for other things? I'm thinking in particular well, climate change, where you've got yeah. a recalcitrant oh. element who who still say no. Look, I, I don't believe in direct. I'm not a fan of direct democracy, right? Because I, I I think the you know you've 
Well, nor am I, but, but, but you opened the door to this. No, no, well, no but, let, but let me just put this to you. It, it worked with marriage equality because it was a pretty straightforward question, you know. Should, same, should the law be changed to allow same-sex couples to marry? That's, that's understandable. You look at the UK where they had that vote on Brexit. Um, you, but the government there, I mean, it was a terrible mistake having that vote because the government was basically saying, um, do you believe we should leave the European Union? Um, we don't know what it will cost. We don't know what the deal will look like. And of course, neither do you. So we have no idea about the consequences of what we're asking you about. So just give us your utterly uninformed opinion, please. And that's not, I'm not saying that in a patronizing way because everyone was uninformed from David Cameron down, nobody knew. So that was crackers. Um, the, um, I think the, where I think a plebiscite would be helpful, another one, the next plebiscite I would think we should have would relate to the Republic. So my view is that the, when the Queen's reign comes to an end and, you know, all of, you know, that, well, depends how it ends, I guess, but when it comes to an end, there will come a point after that where people will feel, I believe, I hope, that the time is right to reconsider the, you know, Republic issue. And I think we should have a plebiscite. There could be a postal plebiscite, by the way, quite feasible, we've demonstrated that it works. Uh, and the question would be more or less, you know, if we are going to become a republic, should our head of state be elected directly by the people or, you know, via a, you know, bipartisan majority in the parliament? And I think we should do that and we should have a good thrash, thrashing of that issue for, you know, months. And uh, having made a decision on that, you then say, right, we've dealt with that. The people have spoken, for, you know, whichever model, whichever approach, and then you design the amendments and, you know, which wouldn't take long, and then put it up can, in a formal referendum. Can I, can I put a hypothetical to you? I know politicians are loathe to answer hypotheticals, but I'll, I'll try my luck. Well, I'm not a any politician event. any longer, so I can do that. Very good. Um, uh, let, let's say we go through that process and the Australian public resolves that we want a directly elected yeah. um, Australian. That, that model is then taken. So, you know, we could, we could, I think, as you point out in your book, end up with uh, some, some peculiar choices as our head of state. Um, would you vote yes on that referendum? Yeah, I, I would. Um, I would. Yes, I would. I mean, and in that sense, uh, I mean, I think Bob Hawke was once asked that question and he, he said yes too. Um, I would say um, you can design, you can draft amendments. And, I, and George Winterton and I, you know, did them for the Republic Advisory Committee that Keating asked us to, to undertake in um, 93. Uh, we drafted amendments um, for which would apply in the event of a directly elected president. Um, and, you know, which basically make it very clear the president's role is just as a ceremonial, you know, head of state. Um, and so you, in effect, you don't have, a, uh, you know, this vague area of reserve powers that we currently do. Um, the Russian style president couldn't couldn't emerge no, and, and sit no, on top of it and say no, no 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 exactly no you couldn't no you 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 you, you can you can legislate it. It's, it's a lot more drafting um, and, uh, and it, would, it would work, but I, I think it would be, I, look, it, 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 it wouldn't be as good as the parliamentary appointment model, in my view, but I think if the people conclude that they want to directly elect the president, then that's the parliament's job to make, to make sure the amendments uh, reflect that and also uh, reflect the, uh, you know, the role of the president. But, you know, I just draw everyone's attention to two points. I mean, one, whenever we did a focus group on this, large or small, the support for direct election plummeted within minutes of people realising that if you have an election, it's going to be a political contest. And, you know, you will end up, as Neville Rand used to say, 
the candidates may not be politicians at the time they nominate, but if they win, they'll definitely be politicians. And, uh, and you know, Keating used to make exactly the same point. He'd say the, you know, Paul, Paul you know, I don't know what Paul's thinking nowadays, but he used to say at the time that, you know, all of those uh, more conservative figures, uh, you know, retired high court judges and, you know, constitutional gurus who were able to say of the 99 model, it's safe, it's workable, you know, uh, they, you know, they would have, that they would quite likely have some pretty serious reservations about a directly elected president in our political climate. But mm. you know, that's why you've got to have that direct election versus parliamentary appointment debate separate from the referendum. You've got to have mm. it beforehand mm. uh, and have a, and, and, you know, have that debate uphill and down dark mm. and, mm. uh, and see where it, see where that lands. Um, we're, we've got about 15 or so minutes to go. Uh, so I just want to get a few reflections from you, if, if I can. Um, Stephen Richardson is asking, uh, if you found the keys to Michael J. Fox's DeLorean tomorrow and you could go back in time, what advice would you give a young 18-year-old Mal Malcolm? Um, hmm, that's a very good question. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I don't, there's nothing. I mean, I've made, I mean, 18-year-old Malcolm, I think... I tell you what I would do. I tell you what I would advise a young eighteen-year-old Malcolm Turnbull to do. I would say, um, get uh, focus on quantitative skills. Um, you know, I think I was always underdone on mathematics. I mean, I have a reputation for being numerate, which is uh, probably a bit exaggerated. Like my reputation for being technologically savvy, that's exaggerated too. Um, but yeah, I think it's, uh, I mean, uh, you know, my, over the years, the things I've wished I knew more about are all essentially quantitative areas, you know, particularly engineering, design, um, you know, economics, I've picked up a fair bit, but, but I'm, I, I, I'm a, I suppose, um, something of a frustrated engineer. I like, I like, I like to work out how things operate. That's why I enjoyed water, because, you know, water, frankly, water is easier to understand and learn as a layman than uh, perhaps electrical engineering, let alone, uh, you know, uh, computer science. So, so that's, that's what I do. So get, get more quantitative, young Malcolm, spend, spend less time, well, perhaps, I I'm glad I did law. I, I'm glad I did law, but I did law for the right reasons. I mean, I'm sure there's lots of, well, I hope, I don't know how many people are watching this, but, but the you know, the, the, one of the best bits of advice I give young people is don't study law unless you want to be a lawyer. Mm. You know, there's a sort of tendency for people to do it as a, like some kind of general degree. If you want to study something that's, that's not going to be equipping you for a vocation, then I think uh, there's lots of things that are better than law. Mm. There, there, I mean, there is a disturbing number of people uh, at my old alma mater at Sydney Uni who uh, they want to study economics or arts or whatever, and then they end up getting 99 point whatever you need to get in and soon change their, their preference over and automatically suddenly want to do law. And you sort of think to yourself, but, but why? I mean, yeah, yeah why? I agree. I mean, law is doing, studying law, if you don't want to be a lawyer, is crazy in my, mm. my humble opinion. I, not to say there is, isn't worth doing a few law subjects, um, but you know, it's a it's a vocational uh, degree. You, you wouldn't study dentistry if you didn't want to be a dentist. Uh, and um, you know, whereas there are so many other things you can learn that are more generally applicable. Can, can I ask that last question in a slightly different way? Um, uh, having having been through the the sausage machine of Parliament and public life. Um, would you do it again? And specifically, uh, if one of your two children came to you and said, Dad, I'm thinking about a career in, in public life, uh, would you tell them, you know, do it, go for it? What, what would you tell them? And, and, and I, should, I should preface everyone watching this by saying, one of your children has not asked this question. This, is, this has come from me, not, <laughs> not 
Alex or, or Daisy? Or Daisy. Well, I mean, Alex and Daisy are both, you know, grown ups. I mean, they're uh, they're. Uh, I, I was I was at uni with Daisy. Yeah. Okay. Well. Well. So you're 35 then, uh, or thereabouts. So, and Alex is a couple of years older than us. So they're both. Uh, they, you know, they know all about what politics is like. I mean, they were grown ups when I went into politics. Look, I think I think as long as you know what you're getting into, uh, you've got to be very clear eyed about it. It's um, it is a tough business, but it's an important business. Uh, it's a privilege to be able to have a hand in steering the you know the com- country's destiny, determining the policies and laws that are going to you know impact on the lives of our children and their children. Uh, keep you know just. Just it is a it, it is a, such an enormous responsibility. Uh, so you've got to welcome it when any talented people want to get into it uh, and do it. And so I'd always encourage people, but you've got to. It's important to know what you're getting into. It is very it's Canberra politics, federal politics is very tough on families, obviously because of if for no reason other than the distance. And I think the the sort of the uh, you know, the, the, the nature of the criticism and the media is very, very intense and unrelenting in a way it wasn't, you know, when I was a young political journalist in the mid 70s. And so that makes it tough too. So you've got to have a thick skin. It's also very hard being married to a politician. I mean, just terrible, you know. Uh, we, you say as yourself a, a spouse of a former politician. Well, I was, uh, yeah, I was a, yeah, that Lucy was, that that was not too bad. I mean, that was Lucy was, I was the, that's my great distinction in local government, the first man to be Lady Mayoress of Sydney. But the, um, but no, that was, that was, that was not too bad. I, I, I handled that all right, I think. But the, but, you know, in federal politics, it is, you know, where the uh, contest is very, very fierce and often very personal. The, protagonist, uh, the politician, can defend himself or herself, denounce their opponents, you know, do all that. The spouse uh, sees somebody they love being beaten up and they can't do anything about it. It's pretty, I think it's it's pretty hard. I mean, I actually felt that way about, when Lucy was Lord Mayor and she was coming under fire, I felt, I felt like that, but it was not, you know, the uh, the intensity was nothing like, you know, national politics. Uh, but it's um, it is so it is it, that that is tough. It's got to be if you're, you know, if you're married uh, and with a family, you've got to make sure your family is absolutely committed to it and knows what they're getting into as well. In that um, in that highly conflictual environment you spoke about. Uh, were there any friendships over the other side of the fence that, uh, that before you, you mentioned Bob <clears throat> Carr quite early on that you met as a, as a young university student that um, mm. gave you some reading to do when you came in to complain about being <laughs> no. ripped off at uh, Paddy's Markets? Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's, that's exactly right. Yes, demoted to working on the watermelons. Uh, my, <laughs> never, <laughs> my upper body has never been as, as well developed as it was then. Um, look, I, um, you know, in Canberra, the, well, look, look, okay, I'll start again. I've had a lot of friends in the labour movement uh, over the years. Um, and I have a, had a, you know, when I was, include, well, he wasn't a friend, he was, you know, far too, uh, much, so much older than me, but, you know, I actually knew Bill McKell and of course, Jack Lang, when I was a student, I used to go and interview them. Uh, and Bill McCurl lived down, I think, down in Double Bay. He had an apartment uh, not far from where I am now. And he um, is a delightful old man. Really, uh, really made me feel at ease. Whereas um, <laughs> Jack Lang was very friendly to me, but he was, his just presence was terrifying. You know, he was so enormous. Um, so, yeah, I've had a lot of friends. And obviously, you know, my, one of my best friends throughout my life has been Neville Rand, of course sadly no longer with us, but I, in parliament, I really didn't make uh, friends on the other side in parliament. I mean, you know, I mean, um, you know, Greg Combe, I got on well with, but generally the, um, the, in Canberra, 
the partisan combat is pretty intense and the parliament itself is really badly designed. I mean, there's nothing we can do about it. We're stuck with it, yeah. I suspect, for the next 500 years. But it's, it's a case, and, and Luce was the first person to point this out to me. She's got a much better eye for, you know, built environment than I have, but she's absolutely right. It's the form of the modern part, the new parliament, frust doesn't, the form doesn't follow function, it frustrates function because it is so vast. People get lost in it. And, you know, you, the better, the old parliament was better because while it was, you know, crowded, people were always bumping into each other. You know, but there's in the new, in the modern current parliament, you know, there's no, um, you know, uh, there's no bar, there's nowhere where people from both sides regularly socialise. I mean, some people do, I guess, but it's it's limited. Um, so I think it's, um, yeah, it's hard. I mean, to, you know, another um, Labor, quoting Labor Party figures, but uh, I mentioned this in the book, but Tr Trish Kavanagh and uh, Laurie Breton, you know, who are uh, great friends of ours and those, you know, years ago, and I mean, still are, but we don't, haven't seen them for a while, but uh, I remember they said to me long before I got into Parliament, um, just, they said, if you ever get into Parliament, Malcolm, hang on to your friends because you'll never make any friends in politics. And sadly, there's, you know, there's, there, there are obviously exceptions to that, but mm. a lot of truth in it too. Mm. Well, that's a, uh, that's a fairly somber note to, to end the um, <laughs> end of the chat with. Um, but uh, we're, we're right on time now. Uh, so look, I just want to thank you for, for carving time out of your day to, uh, to talk with us. Um, and to the, the people watching, I really would say, go buy the book, read the book. Um, it's, it's big, but it, uh, you, you're, you're a brilliant writer. It flows. Oh, thank you. Thank um, you. So, you know, I would absolutely recommend uh, uh, picking up a copy and having a read. Thank you very much. It's great to be with you. And, and thanks, everyone, for, um, for watching and uh, sending in those questions. And sorry we couldn't get to more of them. Thanks so much. Thank you.